three main narratives I was hearing when I was doing civil society work in Singapore. When we talk among the C-suite people, right, everything seems possible. Once we hit to the middle management, suddenly everything seems to fall apart. Right? And when we begin to speak right, in different levels across the system, there are three main narratives that have been emerging within these conversations. The first is this burden of feeling powerless. And the whole idea itself is, I want to change, but I will be stopped or be hindered. And something along the way right, will stop or hinder me. It may not be the system, it may not be my boss, it may just be resources or realities or constraints, but something will come in right, that will give me an inability itself right, to make the change I want to see. Okay? The second thing we're hearing of is that it's not that we don't have the resources to change. We can. We can change. But what do you want? Because if you move one direction, you will lose another. Starting off a project is one thing. Bringing it to fruition is a completely different talent altogether. Knowing over here that whatever direction we take, we will have a huge trade-off right, in one particular area. Okay? So there is possible, but there are trade-offs. The third lecture talked about basically the personal cost of people. What we're hearing over here is that people were saying that the personal cost right, to any form of societal change is way too high and they're not willing to pay for it. And these three narratives over here inspired us right, to start looking at, right, then what kind of narratives could we research, work on, recraft, right, or work with such that it could gain some movement? After the first lecture, what we said over here was that the statement was, I want to change, but I will be stopped or hindered. Right? The end of the lecture, we said, when will I begin to acknowledge the need to develop trust, influence, and power? Right? And what we did in the lecture was we unpacked this entire idea that the foundation of change or movement is trust. Right? And that trust is a capability and it's a talent right, that we need to begin to develop. And that if we do want to make right, some sort of significant change, trust is foundational. But on top of trust, there is influence and there is power. Right? And if we ever attempt itself right, to imagine any form of change, then these three elements must be in play. Right? Unfortunately, whether we like it or not. So the first lecture itself, right, unpacked some models around understanding what power is. So the second lecture said right, that managing the middle requires us to voice clear intention and find the third way. That is not about A or B. It's about A and B and understanding how to find the third way. Right? It's not either or. It's and. Right? And how do we have both right, at the same time? Stability and diversity. Let's assume it's something Zuki really is the next Prime Minister. And if he is, and he comes in, he will be the Prime Minister that will manage the middle. Lee Kuan Yew was the Prime Minister that started the beginning. Right? So in the beginning, the middle, and the end, right? in the beginning, this is where Lee Kuan Yew was. Right? And he, to be fair, as a Prime Minister, he was an amazing Prime Minister in starting us with the thing. And here we have Kim Sui Kiat, who embodies the middle, who embodies the balance. We've said that maybe we want a Prime Minister who is a change maker. But we're not sure right, whether or not right, the country is ready for something like that. Because Singaporeans themselves have not expressed what they want. People on the fringe have expressed it. People have talked about it. But there doesn't seem to be any clear data right, that has appeared to go, this is what Singaporeans want. Which brings us to the third and final lecture. And I want to spend some time talking about the middle. It is something I never understood when I was 19 years old. I was on the basketball team. Throughout all the matches that we played, I never understood the middle. I never understood half game, half point, and what that really meant within the game. I never understood how critical it was to coach that section. It was never basically an amazing basketball team over here. We would play and we would enter the middle constantly about 25 points down, 30 points down. Right? And when they're going in over here and the middle, they begin this question. Right? How do we turn the game around? I remember itself right, knowing that I was a mediocre player. And I knew that if basically I would just step down and let the better players play, right, we probably itself like, would have a chance of closing this gap. But the better players were exhausted. So the coach has to decide. Put in a mediocre player, let him run for a while, right? Everyone knows that you're going to step down so the better player will then come in, right? And even if I win this game, then what emotional or psychological damage will we do to the team in the next game? What do we communicate to this particular team itself right, to help them understand that what happens in the middle is not something which is just about strategy and winning. It's also cultural. 
how do we play the middle such that basically the next game and the next game after that, the team continues to evolve, mature and become stronger. The success of Singapore to this point in time, starting wherever we started, right, is that we created a very, very structured society. Right? We created aspiration points, pathways, ways itself that people can begin to succeed. Right? And in these particular structured pathways, we have all learned to fit in. We have all learned to fit in. We have all learned to say, this is our role, this is our place, this is the structure. Right? In aiming itself right, to create some diversity in the country, we have now diversified our structures. Oh, you know, uh, you know, there's science, art and commerce, right? But if not there, never mind, now we open up sports school. We diversify the options of what's available to us. But in a society, we may not have actually truly diversified. By culture, we may not have truly diversified. Although itself, right, right now, I've got many options and I know how to fit into these particular structures. The question is that as Singaporeans right now, do we feel that we belong? If I am not smart in this country, do I belong? Right. If I'm a, not a scholar, do I belong? If I am gay, do I belong? If I'm Indian, do I truly belong? If I'm now currently 65 and above, do I still belong? And what happens to my life after that? Because the entire structure itself is designed, right, primarily itself to support up to 55 to 65. Then who am I when I'm past 65? We seem to have created a society right, where people have learned how to fit in. Right? But by feeling, right, they don't know whether they belong. One of my uh, biggest concerns right now is the number of coaching clients that I'm now meeting who are men. And as they are men, many of them are either uh, leaders of organizations or heirs or inheritors to entire family businesses. Sometimes they are middle managers. And the thing about this over here is that when I speak to each of these particular men, right, and I ask, right, where are your support groups? Right? Where do you go to have this conversation and talk about what is it you're going through? Where do you go to talk about right, the emotions that you are experiencing? Right? And they say, you lot. <laughs> and I say, are you freaking kidding me? Right? Where in our society is there a place that you can speak Fully differentiate. Allow yourself for somebody to hear how you are different. Right? And yet trust that they will still integrate you right? and say, don't worry, you still belong. Where can you go? And then they look at me with this question mark. Because the thing is, it has never crossed their mind or even occurred to them that actually this structure could even exist. That there can be places people can go and have conversations. There can be places where they are safe, that you can go in, verbalize, how am I differentiated? How am I different? We are now currently in the aging society. 15 years time, right? One third of our entire population will be about 65 years old. Right? Where do you think, right, our elderly go to talk about their issues? Or to recraft the narrative? Because as we begin to grow society, there are many, many parts of us that will be able to differentiate. So Pink Dot has found a space, presumably. Hong Lim Park, once a year, they go over there different shit. Then when that space goes and the event is gone, I don't know where else they go to talk. And the trouble with this over here, right, is that fitting in is not belonging. Because when we're fitting in, we're always changing or changing ourselves in order to be the same. Right? And we know that when we fit in, and any of you yourself who have gone to cliques before or parties before and try to fit in, I think you can resonate with me of how lonely that feels. You feel alone, people don't see you, right? You can imagine itself, right? Leaders all across the country, how they try to fit in. School principals, going through whatever work they're doing over here, right? Really having the burden itself of how difficult it is, right? To nurture an entire new generation, not knowing what to talk about, but not daring to go over to their colleagues and say, I'm having impossible time. I feel like quitting. But because principles need to fit in, right, they may not find a place where they can belong. They can't talk to their own staff. They can't talk to their own peers. Then where do I go? But in order for me right, to be able to do the things I do, which means I'm making whole decisions over systems, right, I need to know I belong to you. 
Because I am terrified that every time I make a decision, you will hate me. Because if I make a decision, I will separate myself from you. I will do what's necessary. But for God's sake, if you can make it a slightly easier for me, just by letting me know that I still belong to you, it will make my decision easier. But where do I go to have these conversations? And I'm not sharing this to you in some hypothetical. I'm sharing with you right, based upon data that I have heard from not just about 15, 20 principles. They don't know where to go. So when we hear these things over here, what we're talking about, and hear me clearly here, is not an infrastructural issue. It's a community and cultural issue. We have yet to learn how to talk. We have yet to learn how to create safe places to talk. We haven't got these things yet. But without these safe places, people cannot differentiate. We can't talk about race and religion. We can't talk about gender. I want you to see what it means right, to differentiate. <laughs> she's free to differentiate herself. Now what I'm startled by is not the fact that she did that. What I'm struck by is who is the one holding the space for her that allows her to do that. She's growing up with some safety. Such that she can do strange things like that. And maybe along the way, she might know to bring some skill. Differentiating is necessary for creativity. Singapore has to change. Singapore has to come to a place to transform itself. Right? And we know the catch words over there are innovation, creativity, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, kind of things over there. In understanding these particular pivots and change, we must go to the emotional dimension of it. If we come to a place where we are not creative and we're not innovating and we're not entrepreneurial, what's the emotional dimension of that? It's not as if we haven't given them the funds, no. It's not as if we haven't given the grants. It's not as if we haven't given the structure. But it's not about the systems. It's about the culture. If people don't have the safety to differentiate, to be weird, slightly awkward, don't know what the hell I'm doing, but very happy with themselves, creativity doesn't happen. So, in order to see new possibility, the scary thing about this, about creativity, is that you are always in the unprecedented. You are always in the uncertain. Any point in time you're stepping into something new, you're immediately into unprecedented. And that space is lonely and scary. No matter how powerful people are. You could be the GCEO, right, of an entire hospital group. And if you're going to go over there with something innovative, you immediately know you're going to get pushed back. And I'm not sure right, how much emotional damage we're doing to our leaders if we don't give them a safer space by which to make decisions that need to make. Where is the psychological safety? Safety, you can give to me. But what happens if you don't give it to me? And if I step out and I walk into the unprecedented and the uncertain, right, then I will pay a price for courage. Why is it so scary? Entrepreneurship, innovation, creativity, making tough decisions. Right? It's that the price you're going to pay is that you no longer fit in. Culturally, the entire country is not fitting in. Culturally, the entire country is about fitting in. You just have to see it right? every single year, right? And the A-level results will be released. Once you release it, those grades systemically are differentiating factors. They're going to differentiate. When they differentiate, right? the amount of emotional pain that people go through, right? Just because they get certain results, right? The key narrative is, I no longer fit in. I need to fit in. When you are a straight D student, the system no longer catches you. If you're a straight D student, right, you have passed A-level cert, O-level cert. You can't go back to your school institution. You can't move on to the next stage. Then where do you go? If we have a place over here where systems don't catch us, but culture catches us, right, you don't feel so abandoned. 
we don't have that cultural space. There are multiple people in Singapore who do not fit into the system. People who don't fit into the system are starting to talk. Social media has transformed this. What you're hearing is not right. All across the complaints in Singapore is I don't fit in. Right? The structure has made a certain choice. We make a rational choice to sell past the state to concern to actually delay back right, that particular CPF. Right? Then you go, whoa, 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 but that doesn't fit for me. Right? And says, no, but we have to make this as a structure. You're getting more and more people coming in, right? And you're saying, okay, no, 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 this is not for me. This is not part of the structure that I want to live in. Right? And people itself might feel that they're not seen or heard or taken care of. And when they go through this over here, you have political parties that will come in, the dressing, not so much, right, basically what's healthy for Singapore. It's addressing a pain point for all Singaporeans. It's not talking about political strategy. It's talking about pain. The campaign strategy is pain. Address the pain. You let me, because I see your pain. I see you. I see everything you've complained about. I see that every single time you raise something, somebody sweeps it under the carpet. But he's saying, I see you. This is saying, see me. Acknowledge me. Take a look at me. If you think these things over here, right, they are unique to America, you need to wake up. There are people who don't fit in and political parties structured to address that. My curiosity right now is how many are going to go in. Cultural tolerance in Singapore for the gay community is more or less there. They can fit in, but I'm not sure they know whether they belong. They can fit in, but I'm not sure whether they know whether they belong. And what they're asking for or gathering together year after year is basically for a sense of belonging. Right? Will you integrate me even as I differentiate myself? Every year, go ahead and do it. I'm okay with that. That's fine. Right? And you live your world, I live mine. Which means you can differentiate, but I don't have to discuss whether you're integrated. You can differentiate, but I don't have to talk about whether you're integrated. And that line between the differentiation is going to get closer and closer. Right? And if you've seen it in other countries over here, when that tension and that boundary is met, okay, we need to know how to handle that. But now, the, the boundary is not met. You live your world, I live my world. Right? I have no problem with you differentiating. But the boundary is coming closer. I made a point in the second lecture and I said, one part that is guaranteeing the social harmony in Singapore is our prosperity. And because we are prosperous, and because we have wealth, and because there's enough pieces of pie to go around, and all of us have a piece of the pie, generally, we don't need to fight. The trouble in most societies over here is that once the abundance starts to disappear and you have limited resources and you must now start choosing who gets the resource and who doesn't get the resource, that's when you fragment. Right? So as long as we remain wealthy, generally we can sweep many of our differences under the carpet. But if I'm to see, and my guess is that 15 years time, Right? And what I'm seeing of Vietnam, what I'm seeing of Myanmar, what I'm seeing within the region over here, is that Singapore is not going to be so snazzy in more than about 15 years' time. We really are going to slow down. And when we slow down, that piece of pie is going to start to shrink. And my assessment was, we're going to start to crack on racial and religious lines. Right? And then this girl sends this to me at the end of the lecture. And she says, I almost interrupted you at your lecture just now to add something, but I thought you hate me for that. You see that first message? She was sitting there and she was going to stand up and says, no, we will not fragment. She could have stood up and differentiated herself. But she didn't because she needs to fit in. And then she said, when you said right, we will definitely crack during the part on lack of abundance, putting stresses on our fault lines, that's actually just your story for now and not definite. Highly probable, but still, there's a small possibility that instead of cracking, we rally instead. That stuff over here, right, is basically where I think her courage comes from. No, you are wrong. That's your story. My story is we will rally. Right? And after that, she balances it. Well, highly probable. <laughs> Things over there. Right? Maybe small possibility. This is the part where, where she's trying to couch it for me. So I don't hate her or get upset with her. Right? And then she says, right, it might seem optimistic, 
Right, but you know Singaporeans are capable of surprises. I think so too. But the bottom line is that even if we're capable of surprises, you still need someone to differentiate the laws. Because I suspect if she did that, in this room, people would rally. We might have ended the lecture believing there's some hope, as opposed to we're all trying to fit in. You see, the issues we have in Singapore are no longer about infrastructure. It's not about bones or institutions. It's about our flesh and blood. And we're looking at our organs, and we're looking actually, we are some of the best bone structures in the world. As institutions, by, by measurement, we are some of the best organs in the world. But we're not talking right now, we're no longer talking about bones and, and organs. We're talking about flesh and blood issues. Are you flesh of my flesh? Are you blood of my blood? Are we of the same blood? Are we of the same body? And if you look at these issues over here, right, right, a lot of the times, government might come in and their main job over here is to guarantee you've got great bones and great organs. But flesh and blood issues is not the job of the government. Flesh and blood issues are jobs of society and culture. Because we choose who is flesh of our flesh, blood of our blood. Because these are all stories of belonging. And if you cover any form of poetry, poetry always talks about flesh, blood, not pancreas and kidney. It's not very poetic, is it? Pancreas. It's flesh and blood issues, family issues, belonging issues. What is fascinating is that if you take a look at yourself of where the country is, around physiological needs and safety needs, right, your bones, in terms of this physiological needs over here, right, in guaranteeing that we have clothing, reproduction, food, shelter, that's your basic infrastructure. Okay? When we talk about ideas right, of safety, these are your institutions. Right? And up to now, institutions, as long as you don't keep sabotaging them, right, smoking, killing your organs over there. Generally, right, they are good. By world standards, right, we are among the best in the world. But if you look at safety and love and belonging and esteem, right, these are basically right, your flesh issues, your blood issues. If you look at the ideas over here of esteem, whether or not I feel right, unique, seen, differentiated, whether or not I'm able to step out, be apart from you and go, hey, this is uniquely me. This is all right, blood issues. Do we still associate with you, even as you stand and bend separate? Now, we've not got to the spirit stage. That's the whole thing putting all together. But if you're running these stages, right, and try to imagine with me, and take a look at the phases of development of Singapore, that if phase one was really about us right, becoming an amazing city, right, as far as bones and organs are concerned, then what is phase two possibly about? If we have already hit right, all the wealth that we could hit, if we're already ranked around the world right, primarily to be number one in, in as far as infrastructure is concerned, then what's the next step? And it's interesting now, because if we can as a society learn right, issues of flesh and blood, safety and belonging, if we can learn these issues, I suspect we will set ourselves apart again. That people will come to our country not just right, to see our infrastructure, so the question is, what can we rally around? And what I understand right now, right, is that our flesh and blood issues, when they are not taken care of, when we don't take care of belonging, when we don't take care of integration, society is fragmented anyway. Paris is going through issues, Hong Kong is going through issues, London is going through issues, the whole freaking US is going through issues, Australia is going through issues. Right? If you look at all these countries over here, the fragmentation is dead. What does the red part of, of the Singapore flag mean? And it really means universal brotherhood and equality of men. What you have down here, right, that the white part is referring to that one culture, the institutional culture of incorruptibility, build the infrastructure. But that part up there is universal brotherhood, the equality of men. How do we create cultures, right, where people feel safe, equal? And these conversations we have not had in our country. We hear it on the forums, but we don't talk about it. And this is what we mean by this. It is not no longer an issue of bad bones or damaged organs. 
We are now in the season where we are now concerned with flesh and blood issues. They are symbiotic, you know. I found the body metaphor was a wonderful metaphor. They are symbiotic. So if you have these good structures here, right, these will naturally begin to flow. If you bleed out, if you bleed out, right, this stuff right, will more than die. I'm just imagining what it could be like. Talented Singaporeans right, leaving their jobs and they're saying, enough. And when I ask, right, why do you leave? They says, I just don't think I belong here. And if you hear the language, they say, I just don't think I belong here. I've tried to innovate, I've tried to do something different, I just give up. This cannot change one. No matter what I differentiate, they just won't spit me out. So how do I belong and be part of this particular society? How do I be different yet still be among the same as you? Do you treat me as someone just simply itself like to mend your infrastructure? Or am I flesh and flesh for that blood? We really asked that. What is this whole NIMBY issue? Right? Why is it that I can't have rental blocks within the normal HDB black flats? Why is it I can't have an old folks home, right? primarily itself among basically these new estates that I build? Why is it that foreign workers can't begin to stay among us? By structure, we imagine they should be integrated. But there's something about the culture that pushes it back. So when it comes down to the blood and where, how it travels, there's only one organ right, that really gets all that blood to move. And as this heart begins to pump, right, the heart, we ask, what do you want? What really is your heart's desire? Where is the heart of Singapore? And where do we go to ask that question? What do Singaporeans want? Where is the heart of Singapore? Where do, where do I go to find the heart of Singapore? You know that the pulse that's flowing through our veins, where do I go to get, get that response? Yeah. And I realize they are missing institutions. We don't have institutions that represent the heart. We don't have institutions that have people gather together and say, this is basically what we have to talk about. So if policymakers right, ever want to begin to talk about policy, right, that ultimately will be blood and flesh and blood issues that will come back itself, right, into organ issues, they don't have a place. They don't know how to find that pulse because there is no geography for it. At least for me, if there's a new challenge for this country, is build those institutions. Build the places that can, I don't know whether they can ever really represent the pulse, but at least you can have a good hint right, of where the pulse is. Because they do the trouble of integrating or bringing the communities together, right, where we can hear the pulse. And my God, if you can figure out how to build that, right, I think that's an exportable product. I think other cities across the world will want to see that particular centre and say, how did you build that? Because we also want to know the pulse. Surely as a policy tool, it would be helpful. In this day and age, in the 21st century, people will rise up whether we like them or not. We can't regulate them, we can't control them, they will rise up. If they are not seen, they are not heard, they will speak. And as they speak, that diversity will flare. The funny thing about this over here is that not seeing them invites rebellion that we get. But it's rebellion not just on others, no. Because when they perceive that they cannot have rebellion upon others, they will rebel upon themselves and they will start hurting themselves because they are so frustrated. But I can't shout at my principal, I can't shout at my teachers, so what do I do? I start cutting myself. You think in this room there's no anorexia and bulimia? Because you need to fit in? Because there isn't a space itself for us to belong? You think over here there's no self-mutilation? Because if we cannot rebel upon the system outside, we rebel upon ourselves. But if the strategy right now is that in order for you to belong, I will attack the institutions. Because that's essentially what the strategy is. Right? You don't belong, don't worry. I attack the institutions on your behalf. Right? Then I'm worried. This is an emotional strategy. And it's attacking these institutions right now. Right? But because this is so big and so weighted, right, there actually will be momentum. Trump just spent the past three and a half years attacking institutions. He tore down everything now. Attacked the media, attacked his own cabinet, attacked his elite. But people love him for it. You're amazing. So this is already happening. 
as our people and communities differentiate themselves, separate themselves, say that we are different. As they do this, the societal question is whether we choose to integrate again. It's a question that we need to confront as a people. They will differentiate. We need to talk about whether we want to integrate. But the thing about this, these are no longer about fitting in. These are questions of belonging. Ask ourselves, do you think we belong to ASEAN? Or if I ask you the real question, do you think we belong anywhere? Where does Singapore belong? Who wants us? Who's our clique? Where do we go for safety? So the amazing story, right, that came, happened in 2008, during the global financial crisis. And during the global financial crisis over here, countries and economies across the world were sliding, right? And Singapore, because of our financial prudence, right, was not sliding as bad. We were hit, but we really weren't hit as bad, right? We actually had enough reserves to bail people out. That's the resilience package. To have the resource, uh, to be able itself, to just literally just pull out 40 billion out of nowhere and save an economy, and we turned around in one year, right? That's a big deal. But during the time of that recession, right, in 2008, okay, multiple countries came to Singapore and asked them, asked us to bail them out. You don't have land? We have land. We'll sell it to you. And they show us, right, the tourist revenue, how much you can make. This is the asset worth buying. So Singapore in 2008, right, during the global financial crisis, had a chance uh, to land grab. We had a chance uh, to buy over other countries' national monuments, you know. And you know what Singapore said? No, we will never hit you when you're down. We will not buy any of your land, any of your property, any of your national monuments. Instead, we will loan you money, minimal interest, you will survive this. In 2008, we made more friends. And for a small country, the only hope that we have to survive is if we belong to you. Because if we belong, you will take care of us even in bad times. So this is a country over here, right, that manages relationships as much as it manages money. I've always thought over here, right, we're a money-grabbing little pragmatic country. But if you really think about it, if you're small, right, and insignificant, actually you will pay attention to flesh and blood issues as much as you pay attention to bones and organs issues. We pay a lot of attention to it. If we cannot establish belonging in the world, because God knows how difficult that will take over here, then at least fundamentally as a culture, we can learn how to establish belonging among each other. And I suspect if we learn the technology or the know-how of how to make that happen, and I say it again, I think we can export it. Because the rest of the world is all figuring this out. How do I help all these immigrants belong? How do I help the older people belong? How do I help people with disability belong? So I speak it as strategy. We can figure this out. Our bones and organs are in place. We're not struggling with dual pieces of work. We have half the job done. We have as much chance as any other country in figuring out how to create cohesive societies. We can figure this out. We've got a good chance. If we have this amazing little country at this particular stage over here, we've already built these particular infrastructures, then what's next? It is the mediator that has the personality to make this work. It is the person that's able to stand in the gap and say, I hear you, I hear you, and make it work. It is the mediator that makes this possible. He always stands for common ground. Common ground. He stands for common ground. He searches for it, he looks for it actively. In the next phase of Singapore's development, right, we're looking at how do we create inclusive whole societies. And the mediator will suddenly have completely new value. But the Singaporeans must want it and say, we want to look at flesh and blood issues. Or at least begin talking about them. At least. Until that collective purpose is established, right, we really have no need to be courageous. Let's talk about being brave. When your life is at risk, specifically, when your life is at risk and you step into work anyway, you are being brave. Firemen are brave. Right? Policemen entering into a robbery case are brave. Brave has a lot to do with fear, but it's fear around a loss of life. Bold is different. Bold refers to a person who punches above their weight. My life may not be at risk, 
Okay, so I basically stuff I have this person come out, right, and a 12 year old girl then says, Come, I'll take you on, right? And here we're gonna start a spa, right? People go, Whoa, got balls. Uh. That whole thing of hell got balls, ballsy, daring is bold. So Singapore is bold. First phase of development, bold. Right? We come out, let's get who, come, try. That's being bold. Right? But notice, uh, bold does not have a rallying effect. People might watch and go, whoa, ballsy, uh, but they sit and watch in entertainment. Right? Because how, how ballsy you are. But it doesn't rally. People go, wow, good job. But we didn't pull anybody along with us, you know. Nobody moved together. That's the nature of bold. Heroic is also different. Okay. In heroic, in brave, you might actually die. In bold, you might actually lose. The hero doesn't lose. When you go, wow, hero! Ah, you look up to this person. But again, the hero doesn't rally. The hero is representative. The hero comes over here and does what they do, and you go, that is an amazing part. Right? This is my hero. Right? They become icon. They are iconic. Right? They are people we're proud of, but we don't necessarily become. When Wonder Woman had that one scene where everybody remembers, and she was in the trenches, and everybody was scared, Right? And Wonder Woman itself right, said, right, you know, why are we not going over there to actually cross those particular trenches? She starts to climb up that particular place and the music starts to rise and people are watching her cross that and start to fight. No one thought that she would die. No one even thought she'd be harmed because she was an amazing hero. Right? And people watch that and go, holy crap, we will never be you, but we're amazing and we're glad that you're on our side. Right? But there wasn't life risk. But if you watched Endgame in that final scene over here, right, where Captain America was the last one standing, broken shield, right, standing over there, and he gets up anyway, and he steps up and goes, and there's fear in the room, and people are holding their breath, right? And Captain America, we know, is going to get pummeled, but he does it anyway, right? That's not heroic, that's courageous. And that has a very powerful rallying effect. When you're watching the theatre, you feel like just standing up and joining them. Courage has been ignited. Because courage will rally. Take a look at this in the context of Singapore. The first question we ask is whether or not Singaporeans have a chance to be brave. By context, because we're one of the safest countries in the world, bravery doesn't show up. When you have low fire, when you have low crime, when you don't have life and death situations around, you don't get these particular brave acts. Because you're a safe country, the emotion is no longer relevant. We want to feel brave. Next question. Is there a need to be bold? Right. And this is part of the cultural psyche. There was a need to be bold, to punch above our weight, right? to do these amazing things. But when you're in basically the top class over here, and you step in and you're already at the top right, of your whatever weight class that you're in, right? how do you punch above your weight? You're the one that people want to punch. <laughs> no, you get it. We have become the ones that people want to punch. We are top of our weight class. If you look at the third world around heroic, right? To win on behalf of, culturally, maybe because we're so interested in fitting in, no one wants to be the hero. No one wants to step up. So if you're looking at these particular emotions here, you notice that these emotions have become less and less important for us. But if you cover other cultures and other countries, heroism is still very much there. Right? Boldness is still much there. So right now, if you ever travel to Vietnam and you get under their skin, my God, they are bold. Vietnam is optimistic. And they see things as possible. And they have cultural capital. And they are huge. And they are young and they are learning very, very fast. Right? So of course they're going to inspire their people. But courage could be something we need to begin to learn. Courage is actually a very complex emotion. So let's look at basically the first idea, okay, sorry, the first component of what goes into courage. We know this, fear is a precondition to courage. In order for courage to show up, fear must exist first. If there isn't fear, there isn't courage, okay? But courage, right, which is interesting about this, 
It's unlike bravery, where basically there's a physical danger. Right? Courage often shows up right, when there's a social or cultural danger. When we use these words, or how Brene Brown has popularized it these days over here, she talks about vulnerability and courage. What she's saying over here is that as we begin to speak, there are two dynamics at play. When I am fearful, I am fearful of what? Differentiating myself. If I speak out right, and talk about basically what is real, right, and I differentiate myself, right, I will move against what the established norm is. That's why you must recognize people itself right, who exhibit courage typically are exhibiting part of the minority status. They're exhibiting part of the minority status. So that's the first component right, that goes into courage. Second component, when they speak it, okay, it is very rarely isolated to one person. It is something that is shared by many. So, stay with me. Huh? Let's say I'm going to reveal to you that I have a sexually transmitted disease. I'm differentiating myself. Right? But notice over here, because STD is, may not be shared across the board, it doesn't have a rallying effect. Do you follow? So although I differentiated myself, I'm not speaking into a differentiation that all of you can identify with. Okay? In fact, my differentiation might make you feel awkward. But if I spoke to a pain, right, which all of you can identify with, right, and I speak it out, and I show you that even though I have spoken it, I am still whole, it has a rallying effect. Well, three months ago, my uh, pastor asked me to do a sharing in church. And he asked me to share about how I have overcome pornography. I couldn't agree. Because he thinks I've overcome it, but I haven't. I'm not sure I would share it as an addiction. Because I don't think I, I don't know, I could be deluding myself. But it's there, it's present, and it kills my integrity daily. I said, I can probably share about the struggle, but I can't share about the overcoming. I share this because I'm not even speaking to men per se, because I'm not even <laughs> speaking about pornography. Because I'm, if I'm not wrong, there's no way you can live in a society like this, with as much strain as there is, but with no safe places to go, that people don't look for some place to escape. And I speak it in the hope to understand that at least for me, no matter how much I go through, I have never let the hope die that one day this will be out of my life. I won't let the hope die. One day, it will be out of my life. After I reach menopause, maybe. <laughs> I'm not expressing myself as needy. I'm not expressing myself as weak. I'm expressing myself as, this is my struggle. This is how I stand whole. This is how I perceive that maybe out there, there are people who can identify. And these elements, right, they need to be in play for courage to be experienced. Because there are three. There is fear of the establishment and of the norm of what can or cannot be said, right, which means there's real stake in it. Basically, there could be a particular purpose to it, a strong intentionality behind it. And the third component is that the person doesn't express themselves as needy or a damsel in distress or please come and save me. I'm saying myself, I present myself broken in the body but fullness in my spirit. And I'm home. And I'm okay for it. I'm not expressing guilt. I'm not expressing timidity. I'm expressing wholeness. But yet, the struggle is present. So I take a risk and I come out here and I say, I trust you. I think you will give me the benefit of the doubt. That's my trust to you. But if you give trust to me, you are giving me safety. That's psychological safety. But it's two different relationships. In the absence of psychological safety, in a society where we have no idea whether people will give us the benefit of the doubt, then individuals need to trust and cross their fingers, right, and say, okay, I assume you will give it to me. I trust you. And I step out anyway. And both are playing in dynamic. But both contribute right, to people differentiating themselves and hopefully reintegrating. 
they both contribute to that. So we talk about anything from disability to foreign workers, right, to LGBT issues, right, to whatever issues, I will suggest to you they are not different issues. They are all the same issue. Do I belong or do I not? And it's important for us to understand that, that we think we're living in a very diverse and complex society with all these different issues. It's not. It's one issue. Do I belong or do I not? Will I trust you to speak? I have this issue. Right? Do I experience psychological safety where you will give me benefit of the doubt after I share? Right? And if we have these two play in play, you then see this. Because my wholeness is my trust. You can't take this away from me. If I come out and I say this and you condemn me anyway, okay, then I am still whole. I am healthy, I am whole. And you can say whatever you say, okay, I live with it. But I'll still do it anyway. When people start to rally, when people say, me too, me too, me too, what they're saying over here is that they will rally and I too identify with you and you are not alone. You have that safety. But if you think the Me Too movement is about sexual harassment and sexual abuse, I don't think you may understand the phenomena behind it. It is not about entirely sexual abuse, sexual harassment. It's about right, a society longing for some level of belonging. And just saying, for God's sake, if I differentiate myself, please rally around me. Say Me Too. And I suspect if these two things come in play, the state no longer matters anymore. And I suspect if these two come into play, the stake may not matter so much more. And that's where I suspect innovation will start happening. It's innovations in our culture, innovations in our systems, innovations itself in what we invent and what we do. We feel safe being different, having crazy ideas. You see, if I come out and I sit here and I tell you my boo-hoo story about how I can't get over pornography addiction, Right? I say, I really cannot, I really cannot, I really cannot. <laughs> and do that. Do you recognize right, that every single person in this room who's also struggling with pornography right, sees me as weak and projects upon yourself that you are also weak? You are not weak. If we sit down here as well, right, and I hold myself as not whole, no one wants to rally around someone who's whining. So if you're struggling and you're in pain, have some courage. You may be broken in body, but you can be full in spirit. If you're in pain, have some courage. And if I'm not wrong, in this country, many people are in pain. And when pain is unseen, unheard, unacknowledged, you will bitch anyway. But it doesn't change things. It doesn't. Am I willing to differentiate so that others can be seen? You're not differentiating to isolate yourself. You're differentiating so that you can flag out, hey, this exists, and others might pop, and they can be seen. Then it becomes a thing. Sexual harassment was not a thing until someone differentiated. So someone must be willing to be differentiated so that others can be seen. The second question we're going to ask ourselves is, am I able to be whole so that others are not seen as deficient? That when I present myself, I present myself as whole so that whoever else is experiencing is not seen as deficient. And in these combinations, right, you will get this wonderful emotion called courage. Because courage shows up when there's stake. And in this country, there is stake everywhere. Right? We live in a very high stakes country. So we need people to have courage. We already, by infrastructure, have one of the most livable cities in the world. What would it take for us right, to create one of the most liberal societies in the world? So up to this point, no one has attempted at trying to create another narrative for Singapore. But I know in the absence of a story, we have no purpose to why we exist. Without purpose, the work is futile and it's tiring. It's firefighting, day in, day out, day in, day out. This message over here right, came in from Lin Xiong Guan. And he said it right, primarily in the context that in anything I have learned right, around managing the entire civil service, right, the one thing that I have learned is that when purpose is absent, right, the work is tiring and meaningless. 
He said, there's no such thing as work-life balance. It's not work-life balance. Everything is work. But he said, when you have purpose, you don't feel that it's work. When you have purpose, it doesn't feel like work. It feels like passion, it feels like ambition, it feels like energy, it feels like I want to drop out of bed and start again. Right? I integrate my family into it, I do it all together and stuff because it's not work. It's purpose. I live with purpose. And I sat down there as I was you know, following the interview, like conceptually getting it, but not really working through the entire emotional frame about this. But today, I mention it because I get it. The cost that we pay are irrelevant. Is there a price for courage? Sure there is. But if there's purpose, the price is irrelevant. The price is irrelevant. So there are conclusions right, to each of the three lectures. One, two, three. This is what we're currently seeing. I don't think it's a perfect script. I don't think it's something that I'm going to work through. Right? But I'm putting it out there so that people can maybe start to bounce off it, discuss it, right? give feedback. Right? At least it starts some conversation. We have community centres all across the country that generally are not serving anything other than infrastructure and facilities. They are not strengthening our identity, they are not coming to a place where we become better citizens, they are not teaching the skills that we really need itself right, to support one another. Right? So what we want to do over here is build a civic centre. Right? It is distinct and separate from a community centre. Right? It is civic in nature and is for the purpose of citizenship. So we will open this centre right, in October, and the name of it is Common Ground. I said this in the second lecture. For the next 10 to 15 years of my life, uh, I'll be doing that particular work. Right? And my hope is to build this into a business model that can actually be exported into the region. Because if I'm not wrong, I don't think we are unique in trying to be able to learn how to figure out Common Ground. If I'm not wrong, every city across the world is fragmenting. And if I'm not wrong, other countries will pay for this stuff. Hopefully, that'll be our part in staying relevant. Okay, I'm done. Thank you.